Here we tackle topics relating to space exploration, including technology, engineering, and futurism. I'm your host, Thor. A government research and development program harnessing the power of nuclear detonations to propel an exploratory spacecraft, Project Orion is one of the most fascinating events to ever occur in the history of spaceflight, and is relatively obscure due to its controversies and complex history. This is a spacecraft proposed as a means to explore the outer solar system, and as an interstellar vehicle with extreme payload capacities. Nuclear pulses offer greater performance than any chemical rocket, while also avoiding their inherent thermal and material limitations. Orion was originally both treated as an ascent vehicle and with a modified Saturn V ascent stage, upon which to test the platform with an orbital assembly of the vehicle. Today we'll mostly assess a ground-based Orion, since this configuration delivers the concept's potential as it was intended. Most classic science fiction readers are familiar with the nuclear pulse rocket, as sci-fi authors of the mid-century and beyond capitalized on the concept very early. Iconic stories such as Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell's Footfall, Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey, and Stephen Baxter's Ark feature the Orion concept prominently in one form or another. So how does an Orion function? Most variants of an Orion vehicle have four main assemblies. Starting at the base, the pusher plate is a large disc-shaped mass with a small mechanical aperture in its center. Nuclear fusion bomblets are fired out of this opening and detonate a distance away from the craft. These shaped charges direct their blast in a cone upwards against the pusher plate, imparting a large impulse. The plate is coated with a graphite oil which prevents damage or wear. The next component, the shock-absorbing pistons, recoil and distribute the blast's impulse over a longer time frame to avoid concussive shock to the vehicle. They can be selectively manipulated to angle the pusher plate and provide angular momentum for initiating maneuvers. The shock absorbers terminate against the bottom of the spacecraft's main hull, housing the mechanical feeding system and bomblet launching assembly. This draws propulsion bomblets from storage magazines inside or attached to the craft and propels them past the pusher plate using electromagnets or gas pressure. Finally, the vehicle's bow carries the crew modules, guidance systems, and support systems, in addition to any discrete systems needed by the mission, such as landers, habitats, or probes. There are two distinct premises to the Orion concept to identify. The theoretical design of the system as it was devised on paper using material limits, and the actual proposed vehicle, which arose from years of development. We'll overlook the theoretical designs for now and revisit this aspect later on in the context of capabilities of more practical missions. Orion was originally presented as an interstellar craft, but this application is not our concern today, as interstellar travel is a topic in of itself. The initial premise of Orion was a purely theoretical concept by Dr. Stanislaw Ulam, nuclear physicist who devised the Teller-Ulam bomb design with Dr. Edward Teller, the first successful nuclear fusion bomb ever detonated. Dr. Ulam recognized the potential for nuclear detonations to be used in driving a spacecraft. The premise to follow this initial idea was the fleshing out of the Orion concept using modern thermonuclear devices instead of weapons-grade bombs, and the functional systems were extensively developed by NASA, who worked on the rover program predecessor to Orion, the United States Air Force, ARPA, and General Atomics Laboratories. Let's look at this history play by play. The history of nuclear pulse propulsion begins with Dr. Ulam, whose work in the field of nuclear physics played a central role in the development of the first thermonuclear devices ever made. Ulam would be tasked with critical work on fission bomb designs within the Manhattan Project, but largely avoided these responsibilities in order to develop his fusion designs. In 1946, he considered using these devices to power a spacecraft. Dr. Frederick Reins, who would be awarded the Nobel Prize in 1995 for co-detecting the neutrino particle, worked with Ulam on the nuclear propulsion concept. By 1955, the two had established designs of various propulsion systems for spacecraft and aircraft. This work attracted the attention of government agencies and was picked up in 1957 and developed by the Advanced Research Project Agency, later known as DARPA. This work would be done under the title of the Orion Program. Research and development was accomplished at the General Atomics Laboratory starting in 1958, where it would continue under Dr. Freeman Dyson until 1963, 
although Dyson states the project formally ended in 1965. Although the Orion program was not a military project, but a space exploration project, when it began, NASA did not yet exist. When NASA came to be shortly after Project Orion began in 1958, the new space agency absorbed many space-related projects from ARPA, but it did not absorb Project Orion, which continued under ARPA's budget. This was the first sign of an untenable long-term situation for Orion, since it was an expansive and costly program but was split between space and defense industries, being influenced by military leadership but with no definite military or defense application. NASA was uninterested in developing Orion, as it was a large budget item and carried with it highly classified designs for small nuclear devices which a public agency such as NASA would have been unable to integrate. NASA did work on the NERVA propulsion system, another nuclear engine concept developed alongside Orion in the ARPA days, which would become an immediate focus of the agency. By 1960, ARPA was no longer interested in funding Orion due to its incompatibility with the agency's shifting objectives, and so theoretical physicist Ted Taylor brought the program to the United States Air Force for sponsorship. At this juncture, the original vision of Project Orion became threatened by radical change in goals. By law, the United States Air Force can only manage definitively military projects, so the Orion program was repurposed from a planetary exploration venture to a strictly orbital military application. The tide of political favor truly turned against Project Orion when the U.S. Air Force finally presented its budget-allotted, prototyped already Orion designs to President Kennedy during a major project briefing. Kennedy was presented schematics for a 100,000-ton orbital battleship carrying thousands of nuclear warheads and nuclear-pumped laser cannons, as well as carrying orbital shock troops and kinetic ground attack weapons. People at the briefing reportedly said Kennedy was visibly stunned at the prospect of these designs, and after a refusal and a sleepless night, went on to make moves to kill the program. Dr. Freeman Dyson, often referred to as one of the architects of futurism as it exists today, spearheaded the Orion concept throughout its lifetime and held strong feelings towards its eventual cessation of experimentation, stating that, The story of Orion is significant because this is the first time in modern history that a major expansion of human technology has been suppressed for political reasons. He says this in the paper Death of a Project, which can be found in chapter 19 of his collection From Eros to Gaia. Dyson's words here are more loaded than they appear at first glance, so let's unpack what he means. By invoking the phrase, the first time in modern history, he is directly comparing Orion in importance to the findings of Galileo and the heliocentric model, drawing a parallel to its subsequent censure by the Catholic institutions of the time. He further implies that Orion is not a tangential technology, but a central one, as important as any other modern scientific innovation such as the microscope, the steam engine, the controlled nuclear reaction, or the laser. Dyson is known for having strong political opinions in the direction of space exploration, so while his assertions towards intentional suppression of the Orion program certainly are worth acknowledging, there are specific reasons the program was deemed non-viable due to geopolitical decisions we can observe in hindsight without adopting Dyson's specific attitudes. The ratification of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963 limited the scope of nuclear tests and comprehensively banned nuclear detonations in space, and this was seen as a final nail in the coffin for Orion. Breaching this treaty even for peaceful applications would nullify it and allow world powers to exercise full use of nuclear testing in space, potentially escalating the Cold War. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty followed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, extending its terms to other celestial bodies and into deep space. The future of Orion was thus secured with no viable means of reversal and was relegated as a politically unworkable concept. Note that Project Orion was never deemed too dangerous, too expensive, or too ambitious to succeed until much later when it arrived in the public eye under declassification. Public perception over this technology has been influenced by a predominantly anti-nuclear sentiment following the Cold War's ideologically born conflicts, as well as a general misunderstanding of Orion's operating principles. I will make a case for why Orion is today perhaps one of the most powerful, safe and efficient methods of rapidly exploring space our species will be capable of for at least a hundred years. While I have no qualms with presenting Orion as an inherently safe alternative to chemical rockets, 
I realize that spaceflight is about managing risks, and nothing is truly risk-free, and so I am not a proponent for large-scale utilization of Orion vehicles for extended periods. Ideally, only one or two Orion launches per year would be sufficient to accomplish set goals, and orbital construction of vehicles would follow to limit ground-based Orion launches, which have inherently more risk. There are several aspects of the risk management curve to consider as it relates to Project Orion vehicles. These spacecraft offer rapid missions to the outer solar system, but their greatest benefit over chemical propulsion is their takeoff capabilities. This is a feature we would want to utilize to its fullest while also avoiding unnecessarily frequent launches or over-reliance on nuclear pulse engines for leaving Earth's atmosphere. Project Orion originally presented three launch methods. Separate launches of the three Orion core components to be joined in orbit proving the experimental vehicle, a launch of the complete vehicle atop a Saturn V first stage with a nuclear pulse drive taking over at high altitude, or an entirely ground-based nuclear pulse launch. This third option is really what was imagined when the vehicle was first envisioned. The most obvious barrier to realizing the Orion concept today is undoubtedly its potentially dangerous operation, considering its method of propulsion. So we will address this topic first in several areas. These are radionuclides, mechanical risk, crew risk, and security risk. Radionuclides are the radioactive isotopes produced by nuclear reactions, and this is what we commonly refer to as fallout or fission products. Consider the following case study to examine the proportion of dangerous particles produced by one nuclear pulse drive bomblet. Keep in mind a single launch uses 800 bomblets on average to achieve orbit in its discussed configuration. Also note, I am not a nuclear physicist, so as always maintain caution around exact figures, and I will not be using the technical units. Consider a bomblet with a 400 kg fissile mass, of which about 35 kg is a fission tamper, and the remaining 91% of mass is the device's fusion component. A fission reaction will generate dangerous isotopes at around 0.4 to 0.6 of the fission mass. This implies about 20 grams of neutron-rich atoms will be generated, and 5% of these products are harmful to biological life with direct exposure. This brings us to about 1 gram of harmful fallout per bomblet. These are gross overestimations for the sake of argument, and it's absolutely possible to reduce the mass of the fission tamper to 5 to 10 kilograms or even less with advanced designs. This suggests we can reduce harmful radionuclides down to 0.15 grams per bomblet or less. Keep in mind these specific isotopes must be consumed to be harmful and typically have short half-lives before they become harmless. External bodily contamination is not a serious threat with these products, so the major concern here is contamination of crop fields or water supply. These amounts are not a concern for any immediate health effects, however the concern of long-term cancer has always been the main issue with Orion's public image, and indeed, the image of most nuclear science. This is a problem for which numerous solutions with varying degrees of effectiveness can be applied. Dr. Dyson studied the cancer rate potential for Orion craft using weapons-grade nuclear devices operating at around 20 to 50 percent fissile efficiency. Today we would use modern thermonuclear devices or even deuterium fusion, capable of 98.9% efficiency and beyond. Efficiency is directly related to fallout production, and in our previous calculations around 96% efficiency is assumed. Dyson used data from General Atomics for his study to project one death per cancer per year as a result of a single Orion launch. This discussion of cancer risk brings up an interesting scientific conundrum which has split the medical community. There are four distinct ways to model acute and long-term health effects from radiation exposure, and it appears Dyson used the oldest and simplest method known as a linear no-threshold model. Scientists contest whether this method is accurate for modeling the effects of multiple small radiation doses, which under the linear no-threshold model simply stack in a linear fashion until they cross a boundary from harmless to harmful. In comparison, the hormesis model claims that small radiation doses are actually beneficial to health up to a point, after which continual exposure becomes threatening more rapidly. Whether or not low doses of radiation are actually helpful is more of an interpretation of theory, since proving this in the medical study is pretty difficult. 
This is because these sorts of medical studies require decades and large amounts of funding to prove conclusive results. In the case of traditional rocket launches, a single launch produces more carcinogenic material. This material is inherently more easy to become exposed to due to its chemical properties, and launches are often done over large sightseeing crowds as a matter of tradition. With safeguards in place, a modern Orion launch is undoubtedly less of a public health risk than a single chemical rocket launch, short and long term. This is a hard fact, but the boogeyman of radiation is quite a foe for the public to overcome in our era. Orion's bomblets were designed with a boron salt or polyethylene filler, which served to both act as propellant and to absorb neutrons during detonation, a mechanism for reducing fallout. Although this area is highly technical and has been classified for decades, the primer document for Orion's continued planning produced in 1964 highlights in its introduction the quote, possible elimination of fission products produced in the atmosphere. Such a promise, if realized, could reverse public perception of Orion. Launching Orion through a large column of water vapor several miles high to arrest particles and radiation during ascent is an option, as is the possibility of venting a heavy water fog from the vehicle itself, again providing a radiation-suppressing column of vapor. This would also help reduce the phenomenon of electron activation. Electron activation can eventually lead to the creation of unnatural radiation belts in the atmosphere. This problem was discussed in the Orion reports and is usually solved by reducing or spacing out the number of Orion launches in any launch schedule. Mechanical risk considers the failure rate of the bomblet feed mechanism, the potential for unplanned nuclear detonations, the durability of the pusher plate, and integrity of the overall vehicle. Without going into too much technical detail, which can be found at other sources, understand that modern thermonuclear devices have a configurable fission tamper. This tamper is the component which initiates the nuclear reaction, and depending how it is triggered, the reaction can produce a wide range of explosive force, ranging from kilotons to megatons. I propose that inside the feed mechanism of the Orion, this tamper is physically mated with the nuclear fusion material as it's being fired meaning the bomblets physically cannot fuse prematurely. If there is a detonation as the bomb is traveling towards the pusher plate after mating has occurred, it would only equal the device's mass in TNT at most, since a complex digital ignition signal unique to each specific bomblet would be required to achieve a nuclear reaction. This means a premature detonation outside the vehicle would not result in a catastrophic event. Redundancy against triggering of the reaction is increased by an inertial motor, laser range finding, and acoustic telemetry of the parent craft in the atmosphere. Although the pusher plate undergoes significant heating, it does not ablate or degrade due to replenishing coats of graphite oil, so damage to the craft during normal operation is virtually impossible. One might be concerned that the forces imparted by a recoil system, such as the one used on Orion, will lead to damage to a structure as fragile as a spacecraft. Realize that unplanned spacecraft disassembly during takeoff is generally a result of either unmitigated vibration or uncorrected perception around a vehicle axis. The Orion does not contend with these issues, since its propulsion impulses occur at set intervals and can be adjusted without pushing the design outside of tolerances. And speaking of tolerances, an Orion vehicle is not built like conventional rockets. It does not adhere to the rocket equation and can be significantly over-engineered, allowing for an extremely heavy, robust structure and high level of redundancy. Mass budgets are really just not a limiting obstacle here. While acceleration is not constant, an Orion crew will not experience more than 1G during out-of-atmosphere operation, and probably up to 3 or 4 while in atmosphere. The pusher plate, the bomblet magazine, heavy structural bulkheads, and water storage are all used to absorb the radiation produced by Orion's propulsion. An Orion crew would ironically sustain less radiation exposure than a traditional manned spaceship today, since the Orion can be easily built with more shielding against solar radiation than traditional crew capsules.
A large amount of nuclear devices in one location presents a security consideration where sabotage or terrorism might be employed to steal or destructively spread the nuclear material. We already face this problem with our nuclear weapons paradigm, where facilities and vehicles carrying dozens or hundreds of warheads are defended by military installations and personnel. Orion would be no exception to this practice and should not be refuted on this basis. There are four major advantages to the Orion concept as it applies today. They are rapid deployment, high performance, low cost, and benefit. The most crucial aspect of bringing any space exploration technology to fruition in the real world is development time and cost. Development of space technologies requires large and flexible budgets, the continuous support of public and private agencies and governments, a supportive and stable geopolitical climate, and lots of time. Many appealing space exploration technologies, such as electric ion engines, solar sails, and laser ablation propulsion, are still many decades away from being realized because they have not been developed for application to modern spaceflight parameters. These systems will demand billions of dollars of funding, at least, and many years in ideal economic conditions before they can be applied to practical, real-world exploratory vehicles, and will likely never play a role in supporting manned exploration, unless human lifetimes can be extended or suspended artificially. Orion has a distinct advantage in this regard. Not only have the manufacturing techniques, engineering problems, and testing guidelines for an Orion vehicle already been solved, but the vehicles have been drawn up in preparation for manufacture, and the Orion missions to various planets have been extensively planned. The nuclear pulse engine even has a standardized naming convention. These schematics are locked away in Air Force and General Atomics archives, but some of these materials are unclassified and publicly available, although nuclear technology has been heavily redacted for obvious reasons. Take this table of a projected development timeline, where the end of phase one represents project progress up to the start of 1964. Nuclear pulse technology is frozen at the peak of developmental viability, awaiting only full-scale testing. If we were to resume Orion development today with no alterations to the 1964 proposal, we could have manned missions by 2026, theoretically, and a full-scale exploration mission with hundreds or thousands of crew arriving at Jupiter before the end of 2030. Perhaps this is overly optimistic, and it is, but considerations of exploring space always contain an element of such optimism, even in the most rigorously planned missions. Remember that in regards to rocket engines, efficiency does not necessarily equal performance. The Orion's purpose is not to provide a highly efficient vehicle or a long-term spaceflight solution, but a brute force method for launching years or even decades worth of missions and payload in a single launch. It was calculated during development that scaling of the vehicle does not impact drive effectiveness, meaning an Orion vehicle may be 100 meters or 1,000 meters high, weighing millions of tons, and can use virtually identical propulsion systems at both extremes. Therefore, bigger is inherently more cost-effective, even to a point we would usually consider absurd when discussing rocket scales. An entire economic, industrial, and habitation infrastructure could be deployed in the outer solar system in a single Orion launch. For example, you could carry a self-sufficient surface base, an orbital habitat, and research station, a crew of a thousand, multiple independent deep space vehicles, and enough supplies to maintain all of these assets for decades in a single launch. It could place these assets onto one of Jupiter's moons in under a year, from a single ground launch with no resupply missions involved. Establishing the hypothetical cost, or even computing the actual final cost of mission-ready spacecraft is a massive undertaking even for accounting offices of governmental space agencies. And for our purposes, there are five aspects of cost to consider. They are development, construction, fuel, payload, and launch. Each of these things are inexorable to a point, so we'll handle them gently. Orion's development cost is not a publicly available figure, so we'll exclude research and development costs for both Orion and our comparisons when comparing to modern launch systems. Note we'll also exclude the cost of launching, fueling, and supporting the spacecraft on mission whenever possible, as well as payload cost. 
One Saturn V costs about $760 million in 2020 dollars, including a payload native to the vehicle. One expendable Falcon Heavy costs $150 million, but this includes a single launch cost in addition to its construction cost. One Delta IV costs between $150 and $400 million, and note again this includes launch cost. One SLS will cost $3 billion 2020 dollars. Note that a stacked SLS has not been completed as of this video, so this is a rough estimate. While we are not comparing payload cost, it's worth noting the SLS's Orion capsule boasts a price tag of just under a billion. Such a figure is certainly a consideration in planning when it surpasses the base cost of entire alternative vehicles. Freeman Dyson presented estimated construction costs of Orion Pulse rocket designs. These are theoretical designs intended for interstellar flight, and are perfect for our intents, as evaluating this upper limit assures us the cost will be a maximal estimate without worrying about the specifics of materials and manufacturing cost. The most viable configuration he calculated was a 100,000 ton, 100 meter diameter vehicle, estimated at $367 billion 1968 dollars. It will serve as a basis for us to approximate build budgets of smaller vehicles, specifically a 20 meter, 1,000 ton Orion. A 20 meter design could navigate any location in the solar system with ease and maintain a crew of dozens or hundreds for year long missions. First, we'll assume cost scales with mass, making this a simple division operation, so our 1,000 ton Orion cost estimate starts at $108 billion in 2020 dollars, with over 635% inflation applied. Our first concession here is that Dyson calculated an interplanetary spacecraft where we do not require the redundancy he allotted for this task. Problematically, the specific systems you add redundancy to in this calculation are going to be the most expensive as well. 108 billion is a massive overestimate, and it demonstrates that something is wrong with our data. Manufacturing has changed a great deal in the past 50 years, and we ought to consider these advancements are directly reducing our estimate. But even then, this figure is much too great. Before we move on and figure out how to rationally lower our estimate, and cancel some of this error not attributable to manufacture, let's glance at the impact of technology on manufacture. Consider that building and launching a disposable Falcon Heavy costs about 20% of just the construction costs of a Saturn V after inflation, while it has less than half its mass. Relating vehicle mass and manufacturing cost is not a deep comparison by any means, but it does serve to reinforce our point that manufacturing costs have decreased non-trivially in spaceflight. Considering these aspects, we'll need to scale the $108 billion figure back to reflect advances in manufacturing. We'll do this twice to explain how we arrive at our conclusion, first by making a rational guess, and then by artificially resolving Dyson's fair reasoning behind his vehicle cost calculation, as well as revealing what that is. My rational guess is that around one half or more of manufacturer cost can be cut from advances in technology, so we'll work out a cost per ton value based on a $108 billion Orion. Our vehicle is 1,000 tons unfueled, whereas the Falcon Heavy is about 1,420 tons unfueled. The construction cost of an Orion per ton is about $108 million, and the Falcon Heavy is about $105,000 per ton. This goes against our valid assumption that an Orion craft is less expensive to manufacture per ton, and this is a problem with our data, again not an incorrect assumption by myself or Dyson. Keep in mind Dyson's Orion has a propellant mass fraction of 0.25 while at the same time, propulsion bomblets are accounting for no mass in our calculations, but are being figured into our costs. This explains why our estimate seems to be much more expensive than needed. Unlike traditional spacecraft, where fuel is a small fraction of the vehicle's total cost, but a large fraction of its mass, the Orion's bomblets represent over half of the vehicle cost. Dyson devised his vehicle cost projections specifically when designing interplanetary craft, vehicles that must be self-sustaining for hundreds or even thousands of years. We also have no way of knowing whether Dyson included launch and operating cost within his calculations, as he only mentions that payload mass and cost is included. 
This is important, since our 1000 ton Orion does not include a payload, but we factored it into our cost of 108 billion anyway. This means a significant amount of our 1000 ton Orion's projected cost can be slashed because it includes payload. The question of course is how much? We can only guess since the cost of Orion's interplanetary payload is never addressed, and that makes sense since payloads are designed around planned missions. How much of this cost represents fuel can, however, be ascertained with some calculation. Assuming each bomblet costs in the ballpark of $507,1968 to produce, the total fuel cost in 2020 dollars comes to about $3 billion. Note that this number is warhead production cost as of 1982, deflated to 1968 dollars and inflated to 2020 dollars. To represent the cost savings of modern warheads, which is not a factor Dyson would have been able to assess in his time. Now consider the discrepancy between bomb masses using the interstellar mass conversion we've done, in which we must represent our modern bomblets as weighing under a quarter ton, versus the 3,000 ton bombs used on the interstellar craft of Dyson. We scale down this cost using the same methodology we used to scale mass for our 1,000 ton design, bringing us to $44.8 billion 2020 dollars to produce these pulse devices. We've substantiated cutting almost $42 billion from fuel cost by resolving the differences between interstellar bomblets and those we'd use today. This is almost half of our cost figure of $108 billion, and if we weren't using 1982 production costs for our nuclear devices, you would see propulsion represent more than half of the total budget in Dyson's estimation. So we can now substantiate a price tag of about $21 billion for a 1,000 ton Orion. Suddenly, we no longer need to represent the cost of a realistic Orion as a fraction of the United States' gross national product, but rather as a budget item NASA could digest in a few years if dedicated. This is a juncture where I'd like you, the viewer, to entertain Dyson's thought process and situation. He was designing projects unlike any to ever receive feasibility assessments by any research agency or government ever. These ideas were huge, and to pitch them to the US government, Dyson spoke in terms of committing the entire space exploration effort of the United States towards Orion, and indeed a great deal of the country's efforts and economy as a whole. So with this in mind, do I believe a 1,000 ton Orion built today would cost even $21 billion? Absolutely not. This is not a 1,000 ton vehicle designed to visit Alpha Centauri, but we've calculated its material cost outside of fuel as if it were. You ideally should not scale an interstellar starship's budget proposal down to estimate a working limited range interplanetary prototype, but that's what we've done here, both to explain this topic's complexity and to illustrate how drastically launch vehicles and nuclear devices have decreased in cost since Dyson's day. Remember though, we aren't talking about any spacecraft here. This is an Orion nuclear pulse rocket ship. Even if it did cost 21 billion to simply manufacture, such an overpriced Orion still easily beats all the competition in terms of cost per ton of payload. Its ability to loft huge payloads is literally that good, and if you're pitching an Orion to a board of directors who have finances front and center in their minds, you can remind them that a 1,000 ton Orion uses the exact same amount of nuclear material and same number of nuclear devices as a 2 million ton Orion. It's an ultimately scalable system. You only need to expand your bomblets once you've reached theoretical limits. And this disparity should be in no way a surprise. An Orion vehicle is not built like a typical spacecraft. It does not have an intrinsic mass budget for its systems and can be built using materials and techniques you would normally never imagine applied on a spacecraft. A comparison to consider is the Orion being akin to a cargo freighter versus Falcon Heavy which is a super sports car. One costs millions of dollars per ton and the other thousands, due to their materials, design tolerances, and their nature of manufacture. Nuclear pulse propulsion offers a constructive and economically attractive option for repurposing the nuclear weapons stockpile and active arsenals. With a large amount of weapons-grade nuclear material present in the modern world in the form of nuclear weapons, and no real incentive to repurpose it, Getting rid of nuclear weapons is currently unattractive and only viable under intense political pressure. It is often noted that current dearmament treaties are easily reversible if demand for warheads ever increases, and a reversible approach to dearmament is a common practice among nuclear weapons club nations. 
Converting weapons into propulsion for a nuclear pulse rocket offers an attractive economic opportunity, as government agencies could generate profits on those decade-old undervalued investments into nuclear warheads. The legacy of the Orion program is not that of what could have been, but of what can be. I believe this technology will only be ignored for so long, until it eventually manifests, and out of absolute necessity. To use this knowledge is only a choice at this point, and its ability to positively influence the future of humankind cannot be overstated. One day I hope I'll be able to take a deeper dive into this topic since the Orion program has a lot of data behind it and there is a lot of public record now available related to it. But until then, I hope you enjoyed our treatment of it. Please interact with our video and the channel if you'd be so inclined, and uh, feel free to share us with your friends.